This device is called Newton's Cradle, also known as Newton's Ballus or Ball Clicker. It was named in 1967 by English actor Simon Preble in honor of the physicist Isaac Newton. Today we'll explore the motion of Newton's Cradle and how the device illustrates three main physics principles at work. Conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, and friction. We'll explore how these principles are demonstrated by exploring the system's elastic and inelastic collisions, while also considering the kinetic and potential energies of the system. Using this information, we will construct a computer model of Newton's cradle and con consider the design elements and limitations of both the experimental and computer model. The conclusive result is that the experimental model of Newton's cradle, which I recorded, loses energy to the surroundings as a result of the inelasticity of the balls, the fact that the balls are not perfectly aligned at the center, and most importantly, friction. The computer model did a better job at demonstrating an ideal Newton's cradle given that it was easier to set and maintain initial conditions, thus ensuring no external energy transfer. Here's the video I recorded of Newton's cradle, constructed using billiard balls. The origin is placed at the center of the six balls, and one of the balls was calibrated given that the average diameter of the billiard ball was 2.25 inches. The first concept we should consider when looking at this model is the law of conservation of energy, which states that the energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but can be transferred. In the case of Newton's cradle, the energy is transferred between the potential and kinetic energy. When the six balls are at rest, each have zero potential and kinetic energy. When the first ball is lifted up, its kinetic energy remains zero, but its potential energy is greater because gravity can now make it fall. After the ball is released, its potential energy is converted to kinetic energy during its fall due to the work of gravity. When the first ball hits the adjacent ball at the bottom, its kinetic energy is transferred to that ball. The transfer energy continues down the line until it reaches the sixth ball, where it's converted briefly into potential energy as it swings out. Given that no energy was lost in the transfer, the sixth ball should swing out to the same height that the first ball was released at. However, if you look at the two balls as they were tracked on tracker, the magnitude of the height decreases over time, thus indicating that energy was lost. Here, the x and y positions of the two balls are opposite ends of the cradle are plotted and, as displayed, they are opposite in phase and, ideally, should have the same magnitude. This, however, is not the case. It's noted more prevalently by the second graph showcasing the y position that the height of the two balls as they swing out decrease over time. Looking back at the experimental model, another concept we should consider is the law of conservation of momentum, which states that the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. The equation tells us that the product of the mass and the velocity of the first ball is equal to the product of the mass and the velocity of whatever is moving after the collision, which, in this case, is the seventh ball. The first ball throws all of its momentum into the line of balls. Because the balls are not, uh, are not all attached, the momentum travels to an object of equal mass, in this case the seventh ball, which gives an equal velocity. This is important to remember when we will soon construct our computer model. So let's get into more quantifiable data to make our model. For each ball, the momentum principle states that the change in momentum is equal to the net force multiplied by the change in time. Based off this equation and our previous observations in the motion, we know that the forces due to the collision are equal but opposite and at the same time. After the initial con collision, ball 1 is at rest and the last ball moves with the speed v. The final velocities of the first and final balls are noted by v1f and v2f, respectively. To solve for these velocities, we need to bring in another equation using the law of conservation of energy. Given that the kinetic energy before and after the collision is constant, aka that this is an elastic collision, the initial kin uh, kinetic energy is equal to the final kinetic energy. Using this, we can solve for the final velocity of the two balls through a system of equations. So to do so, we'd essentially square this equation and set it equal to um, that that we derived from the conservation of energy. Um, and so conclusively, we end up that V1F, the final velocity of the first ball, following the collision, ends at rest and transfers all of its energy to the adjacent ball. Now we can use this information to construct a computer model. I first created the model only using two balls. In order to make an elastic collision, I, per Dr. Greco's recommendation, created a spring represented by the helix and placed it at the end of the ball too, the ball that would be pushed by the first ball. The first ball will move to the left with an initial speed in the negative x direction. When the first ball collides with the second ball, it will launch the second ball in the negative x direction. Just as a note, I'm doing the demonstration. when I'm doing the demonstration, um, I made the spring color black such that it's not visible. Right now it's CN. And here's the demonstration. Now here's the graph of the change in the momentum of the two balls in the x-direction. For simplicity, the commuter model only takes into consideration the change in momentum of the x-direction, whereas the actual 
um, experimental model has momentum in both the x and y directions. It can be seen by the graph that all the momentum is transferred between the first and the second ball, such that the total momentum is constant, unlike that of our experimental model, and this could be for a number of reasons. One of the reasons as to why the billiard balls lost energy momentum so quickly is because they were low in elasticity, which is the measure of a material's ability to deform and then return to its original shape without losing energy. Ideally, balls for Newton's cradle are made out of elastic materials such that they deform minimally on impact. Secondly, the balls must be imperfectly aligned at the center. This ensures that the balls can only swing in one plane, parallel to the crossbars. If the balls hit each other at some other point, energy momentum is lost by being sent in a different direction. Finally, and most importantly, the reason why our Newton's cradle doesn't conserve energy and why, in general, it's impossible to create a perfect Newton's cradle is because friction will always conspire to slow things down to a stop. Though a small amount of friction comes from air resistance, the main source is from within the balls themselves. So what you see in Newton, Newton's cradle aren't exactly, aren't really elastic collisions, but rather inelastic collisions in which the kinetic energy after the collision is less than the kinetic energy beforehand. This happens because the balls themselves are not perfectly elastic. They can't escape the, um, the effect of friction. But due to the conservation um, of energy, the total amount of energy stays the same. As the balls are compressed and returned to the original shape, the friction between the molecules inside the balls convert the kinetic energy into heat. The balls also vibrate, which dissipates energy into the air and creates the clicking sound that is the signature of Newton's cradle. Conclusively, for all these reasons, it is impossible to create an ideal Newton's cradle. That said, however, the computer model does not deal with external forces such as friction and thus can better model the cradle. That's it for today. See you next time.